Hi there. I'm Angelo John Lewis for the Sacred Inclusion Network. What you're about to watch is an online community exploration that was facilitated by Jim Hickman for the Sacred Inclusion Network during the month of May in 2022. I'll just read you excerpts from a brief introduction um, about it so you can get some idea. Interest in the paranormal and parapsychology have become mainstream, not just in popular culture, but among scientists. According to one study, 83% of Americans said they'd experienced paranormal activity in their home. At the same time, there's been renewed academic interest in things like near-dust activities, neuroscience, and quantum physics, which explore the intersection between consciousness and the physical brain. Um, the facilitator, Jim Hickman, has quite a background in consciousness studies. He'll explain more about that in the video, but I wanted to give you some brief introduction, and I hope you enjoy the video. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, we're the Sacred Inclusion Network. Um, we're a network of folks that are, consider ourselves spiritual but not religious, and some of us want to change the world in a certain way. And if you haven't joined us before, welcome, 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 welcome. And uh, you have also been hijacked into our mailing list, so you'll know about our, our events that come up once a month. And um, I want to, without further ado, I want to in introduce Jim Hickman. And I know that he's going to tell us a lot more about his background. So I'm just going to give you a couple of highlights about Jim and um, tell you sort of how this event um, came about. Very interesting facts, at least for me, about Jim is that um, those of you on, on a certain age know about the Esalen Institute. And you may also know that the founder is Michael Murphy, co-founder. Um, that was Jim's first meditation teacher. Fact number one. Fact number two is that in the 70s and 80s, there is something that was very big called the citizen diplomacy movement, which seems like a, almost, like a, almost like a memory now, which is like a big um, kind of interface where um, they were doing citizen diplomacy because diplomacy wasn't working. And it's not working too well today. But in any event, um, Jim did a lot of work with the Soviets and um, um, and the Americans, particularly around what we're calling parapsychology. And also the third thing is that Jim is the co-director and founder of Ubiquity University, um, which is a very um, integral um, credential institution um, that teaches people um, about a lot of different subjects, which are 21st century. I think that's enough to say. Um, so we're delighted to, I'm delighted to welcome Jim, uh, who's um, kind of a veteran. He's done, the um, latest thing he did for us was a um, neuro, what is it, um, what do we call it, neurology? Sp neuroscience and spirituality. Neuroscience and spirituality. Um, Jim, welcome. The floor is yours. Neuroscience and spirituality. Okay. That sounds interesting. I'll have to watch <laughs> that podcast. Um, yeah, thank you, uh, Angelo. And I'm, I'm glad there are only, you know, we're, we're a small group because it allows us to have a lot of interaction. So please, as we go along, um, ask questions. Um, I'm gonna show some slides uh, that lay out the various areas I'm gonna talk about. And there'll be um, places where we stop the slides and talk about what we what I just been discussing, and uh, so I can get a sense of what is most important to all of you that we can go into in greater detail. Um, and the other thing is that um, I'm glad to send a copy of this of the slides as a PDF to any of you who want that. So at the end, I'll give you my email address and you can let me know because there's a lot of text on some of them and I'm not gonna read them all, but they are, you know, they define the topic that will be, that I'll be addressing during that particular segment of the, of the discussion. And um, if it's of interest to you, you can take time later to go back to it and look them through. Um, and we have till for an hour and a half. Is that yes. right, Angelo? That's right, yeah. Jim. So then um, I want to start with a little bit of, in a sense, philosophical context that's based on science, but 
the way many cultures review um, view science these days is as a description of what really is. When, as you'll see in in my first slide, Niels Bohr, you know, one of the great physicists of the 20th century, um, describes it differently. You want to put up those slides, Angelo? Yes. You can. Um, you don't have to use the first one. Use this. Um, that's way down. That's the end. So this is a, and, and and related context for this is that we're talking about the interface between our inner worlds and the outer world. And of course, when you think of parapsychology, then immediately what comes to mind for many people is, oh, some psychic individual who can use his or her mind to affect things in the outer world. And what we know from neuroscience is we actually do that all the time, all of us. It's not as dramatic as looking at a, as levitating an object, but is still functional in the way that our inner world and the outer world interact. Um, and the models of that have emerged throughout history and are somewhat different. And so as Stephen Hawking points out, um, and that's why a part of this is gonna be about neuroscience because the brain, mind, heart, gut are all involved in the parapsychological functioning that sort of blends into our internal functioning that one could see as somewhat psychic in a sense. So our brains we know now um, are merely an interpreting system that takes input from the external world and makes a model of it. Um, and each one of us basically carries a different model from everyone else because our sensing systems in bring input that's a little bit different. And, and it's interesting about memory. Uh, I won't get into it in detail in this talk, but one of the things about memory is that we believe that we remember what, we, what happens to us. But in fact, what happens is, as it says here, the brain records a variety of electronic signals from the eyes, the ears, the nose, the mouth, et cetera. And the brain holds it all as electronic impulses, not as some image that we remember. And when we recreate a, a memory, all of those impulses are brought back together again to create what we believe is our memory. And it rarely, if ever, is the same as what we actually experienced. Um, and so the brain and the internal system has its own way of creating a world which we tend to rely on. And as Stephen Hawking says, we attribute a degree of absolute truth to that. When in fact, it's a little different from everyone else's. And then science, as Niels Bohr um, points out, it's not the task of science to find out how nature is. It concerns what we say about nature. So these are important points as we talk about parapsychological phenomena and go to the next slide and how our, um, the way we have apprehended our external world, translated it into our internal world, creates our beliefs about how that external world actually uh, is put together. And our beliefs then reflect our thoughts and dictate our habits. And there's a way to influence our external world by realigning our unconscious beliefs in the way that we actually want the external world to manifest itself in our lives. Go ahead to the next slide. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that. 
but I wanted to start with a brief exercise and, and illustrate the vagus nerve because the vagus nerve is probably, is, is one of, if not the most important nerves in the body. It's the longest nerve of the autonomic nervous system. You can see there on the left. Um, and it goes from the brain all the way down into the abdomen and the colon. And it communicates to all aspects of the autonomic nervous system and interfaces with the parasympathetic control of heart, lungs, and digestive tract. So the way we treat our vagus nerve is really important to the overall functioning of our inner world. So I just wanted to take a minute to introduce a short practice um, that is a really effective way to just re release tension, remove concerns, settle back into the basic structure internally of who we really are and allow ourselves to um, act in the world from that internal space. So if we could just, let's close our eyes for a minute. And this is a very simple exercise in which you take, I place the right hand, I place my right hand first just below the neck. And then it's a simple movement, slowly moving down the surface of the body to the abdomen, just below the navel. And then the, with the left hand, follow that movement. So over a minute or so, you just very slowly are caressing the vagus nerve. And that begins to straighten out any aspect of it that may be a little constricted because of tension or worry or beliefs about what might happen in the future. And it's a way to calmly bring the body into focus, into the current moment. Very much a, a, um, a partner to the body scan mindfulness practice that Angelo introduced in the very beginning. So when you're in a place where you want to connect a little deeper to your inner self, this vagus nerve massage is a really great way to bring your attention into who we are inside. Next slide. Can you do the next slide? I thought I did. Angela? Hang on. Here we go. Sorry. Now, um, why don't we go back to um, the group? We don't, I don't need to see all of this. Okay. I want to, I'm going to talk about all of this. So what I wanted to start with then is to give you more of a background of, um, of how I came to where I am today, which is a journey through, um, well, we could start with psychedelic drugs in the 60s, <laughs> but, you know, moving into, and could you put the... Um, the group of us on the screen again instead of this slide. Okay. So, um, stop. Yeah, there we go. And um, just gonna go to gallery view so I can see everyone. And um, it's it it's an interesting experience as one gets older to look back on your life and see events that occurred much, much earlier for what you thought might have been a good reason, but in fact had an impact later in life that gave the whole journey what I call a life worth living. And that's a part of what I've been reflecting on in recent years. So a part of that is it begins in 1969 when I joined Dr. Stanley Krippner 
at the Meninger Dream Laboratory in Maimonides Medical Center in Brooklyn, New York, where at the time, Krippner and his colleagues were doing the most advanced work on what we called psi-conducive psy states of consciousness. Various states of consciousness facilitate parapsychological events. And the focus then was dreams. In the dream state, partly because we can monitor with an EEG uh, a person, a dreamy, a sleeping person's brain waves, and see when he or she is dreaming. And then, so we, we um, executed these experiments in which um, a person who had demonstrated some psychic talent would sleep in the lab, and we would monitor the time in which they entered a dream state by looking at their brain waves and completed that dream. And during that period of dreaming, in a um, distant area, there were one or two people who would randomly select an image and try and project that telepathically to the dreamer in the laboratory at some distance away. After the dream state was completed, we would wake up the, the, um, the subject, we called them, and ask them to say a little about the dream and then give them um, several different images and ask them to choose the one that most characterized the content of their dream. And over time, over several years of research, a number of people demonstrated, of course, this is science, so statistically significant results in choosing the correct image that was being te telepathically sent to them um, to influence the content of their dreams, showing the, um, the existence of telepathic input and its impact in the internal state of certain individuals. Now, one of the things I remember most from those days, I remember 1969, um, so um, I was 22, and... Um, you know, had been through the 60s in a very dramatic, um, as a full participant, we might say, in sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And one of the big rock and roll um, bands of the time was called the Grateful Dead. Some of you may have may remember the Grateful Dead. Um, and several of the band members were friends of Dr. Krippner. So we arranged with them to go to a series of concerts the Grateful Dead had near Brooklyn because we knew that the 10,000 people in the auditorium were all in an altered state of consciousness. So this was consistent with our psi-conducive states of consciousness investigation. And same thing. At a certain point in the concert, the dead would stop and Jerry Garcia would say, now we're going to do a telepathy experiment. In Brooklyn, which was at that point about 15 miles away, there are people sitting in a laboratory who are going to send an image to all of you, and um, and and your task is to is to process that and let us know what you think the image was once we give you a set of images to choose from. So I like that kind of experimenting because I got to be at the Dead concert and be <laughs> the one who showed the images and stuff, and. Um, one might say it was fairly significant in that, you know, the, the, uh, most of the time the correct image was shown. But this goes back to one of the um, earlier slides about science and beliefs. The thing about parapsychology is that m much of what has been recorded throughout history and studied is often somewhat spontaneous, not quite controlled, and therefore can be dismissed by a traditional scientist who doesn't believe in parapsychology. But again, that goes back to what we said earlier. That's a model we carry within ourselves. So the great Randy, for example, who is one of the greatest magicians of all time, always could say, oh, that guy does that. I can show you how I do it from sleight of hand, and therefore it doesn't exist. So that's an example of a belief system that discounts external reality in a way 
that that seems to prove it doesn't exist. Where in the fact in science, it's about constantly describing the latest way we understand external reality. And what has happened with neuroscience and quantum physics in recent years is that parapsychological phenomena have become more and more um, uh, have more and more fit into the traditional notion of how science describes the external world. So in those early years, um, I um, helped create a, a research laboratory in San Francisco, and we studied a number of psychically talented individuals, like a man named Yuri Geller. Some of you may have heard of him. He used he he lectured a lot on parapsychology, and he had a specific talent of bending metal objects without touching them or starting broken clocks that hadn't worked for a long time or other things that were spontaneous. And um, one of the, um, uh, there, was an, uh, there was a time in which during his lectures, um, a, a, a large number of young people from the audience began to um, show spontaneous psychokinetic effects at home. So we got numerous reports from parents saying, I opened up our, the drawer of our best china and all of the silverware was turned into knots. And what's going on here? Um, one such um, family uh, of a young woman who was studying Aikido in Japan, she um, experienced Uri Geller live at a, at a performance in Japan and spontaneously began to affect the structure of objects around her. And she was concerned. She came home to see her parents. They called me and I worked with her for three weeks to try and manage or understand what was happening. And here's just one example. My mother had given me a watch several years earlier that hadn't run for several years. And I took it apart and in the um, mechanisms where it runs, I took tinfoil and tied it around so that you couldn't make it work without something, without intervening um, in the in internal workings of the, of the watch. So I used that with several subjects to see if anyone could start it. And, and um, uh, Margie was one of these. So one day, Margie and I took a walk in um, the Presidio and in the park there on the water in San Francisco. And I put the watch on her left wrist and I held her hand like this throughout our walk. And she told me that the night before she had read the autobiography of Yuri Geller and he talked about some spontaneous teleportation experiences he had had. And she said, I want to experience that myself. So we walked around for 45 minutes or so. I would occasionally turn her wrist up so I could see the watch was still there and it wasn't working. Um, and that was, you know, again, the best controls I could put on it because we're not in a laboratory in a Faraday cage. At a certain point, we stopped and she demonstrated some of her Aikido techniques for me. Um, and then we decided to go home. So I took her arm and noticed that the watch was still there. So everything was fine. And we started walking on the other side of the park and all of a sudden she stopped and she said, something's happening. And she turned her arm up. I had her, her hand like this. She turned her wrist and the watch was gone. So we, the next 30 minutes, both of us searched everything she had on her, all the area around her to make sure that, you know, the best we could, there hadn't been some sleight of hand, which I can't imagine could have happened because I had her hand locked the whole time. But that was, you know, important to do. We went home then to, to her parents' house and um, her mother said, I'll make you some tea. So we sat at the, um, in the living room couch and her mother walked in with the watch in her hand and said, 
Does this belong to one of you? I found it in the refrigerator. So these are the sorts of events. This kind of event happened a number of times in the several years I was doing this research. But what's part of the, what's important about it is one, the intent. Margie had an intent to experience this. And secondly, the challenge of controlling all of the environment in such a way so that a traditional scientist would say, yeah, but you know, um, you didn't do this, you did, or you did it all correctly, and there's no other explanation. And that happened with several of the other people I worked with, a young man named Matthew Manning, who was a British citizen, and at the age of 11, he started manifesting spontaneous, what we call po poltergeist events and gained some degree of control of it, was researched in Great Britain in several laboratories. They found that they were able to show he had fairly significant psychokinetic abilities. We brought him to the US and he spent about a month with us, including the laboratory at the University of California, Davis, where they were researching some of this and then our own research laboratory in San Francisco. And the challenge was that in a completely controlled environment, it was very difficult to manifest the, the events that happened spontaneously around him. And so I just wanted to, and I wrote about it as a part of my master's thesis, and I just wanted to read. So for example, a couple of things that came during his visit. Um, For example, Dr. John Palmer, who was a, a um, professor at UC Davis, um, at, who hosted Matthew Manning um, for a while, um, there was a cuckoo clock, which had not operated since he'd stopped winding it two years before. It was in his living room. One evening, Manning listened to an Uri Geller record, and later, John Palmer noticed that the clock was ticking, apparently without having been wound. It continued ticking until he manually stopped it a few minutes later and it never started again. Now, these types of spontaneous things happen a number of times that are suggestive, but don't give us complete insight into what was going on. Palmer gave him the key to his house so he could go home while Palmer was still, still at work. And when Palmer took it off his key ring, it was bent in half. And Yuri had to smash it on the floor in order to straighten it out to get in the in into the house again. Um, a young woman who was um, involved in a radio interview said she was in an expectant mood and wanted something to happen. And when she went home, she noticed in her bedroom a, a closet door was op hanging open that had been not that hadn't been opened for several months. And in the middle of her floor um, was her sewing basket, which she hadn't accessed for several months. And around it lay a number of the contents of the sewing basket. So again, strange event related to her interaction with Yuri, but not particularly provable in terms of how it happened. Um, there were a couple of, of instances with Matthew um, in which he was being televised in a recording in a, in a uh, television interview and recorded and everything seemed fine on the monitor and after the um, interview they played it back and it played in black and white on a color monitor and while they were recording it, it was all in color everything worked fine so these sorts of things happened a number of times. And, um, you know, as some of you may remember, um, there was a lot of controversy about it because most of these events happened outside of a laboratory. Some things, you know, were well controlled. We did some experiments with Matthew and two other uh, talented, psychically talented individuals we worked with in um, um, with rye grass seeds, for example put a vial of seeds, uh, put several vials of seeds 
on a table and gave one to Matthew, for example, and asked him to increase the growth rate of those seeds. He concentrated on it for about five minutes. We planted all of them, and the seeds that came out of his vial grew larger and more prolific than any of the rest of them, for example. So um, that was a part of what, what, you know, those years were for me. And at a certain point, um, I met with Michael Murphy, who at the time was, you know, very involved with Esalen and, um, and was writing a, a book called Jacob Atabed, which was a novel about Soviet work in parapsychology interfacing with U.S. work. And because of the subject and my interest in the Soviet Union, um, we began to collaborate. And that then reviewed for me that in 1972, I first went to the Soviet Union with Stan Krippner to um, report on some of my psychic research at an international conference there. And um, that then introduced me to a number of Soviet researchers who were doing similar work. And it illustrated the main difference between the US and the Soviet approach. In the US, as I've kind of indicated, the focus was, let's prove this in a laboratory because we can't believe it unless science in a traditional sense says it's real. The Soviet side said, it seems to be real. Let's figure out how we can apply it. And so they were working on projects that actually would apply what they saw from psychically talented individuals in Russia to the real world. And that was a part of what really interested me. How do we take these experiments and move them, in a sense, into the external world in a way that benefits society? Um, Angelo, can you put up the next slide? Um, and so, um, that's at the end, go back to the top. Sorry. But while we're getting the next slide up, let me just take a minute and see about questions and answers, okay? Keep going up to the top. Yeah, there you go. Okay, then go down four slides. And then the next slide is Q&A, gotcha. okay? So let's just put the slides away for a minute and let's talk about it, okay? Where, where, what I've described so far and where we're going. Um, responses from people, um, questions, comments. And you're all on mute. So um, uh, take yourself off mute if you know how to do that. Well, and that, and a related comment is at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little icon under which it says chat. So you, if you press that, then you can write a question or a comment in the chat that we can see as we go along. Um, and they're like, Ken is saying what a long strange trip <laughs> it's been. And, um, I, and I appreciate Bill's comment about, um, you know, we just have to keep moving forward in life. And, and as these unusual events seem to impact us in some way, remember that our internal processing system is trying to fit them into a model of reality that makes sense. You can go on to the next slide. You know, we know from um, looking at the history of the brain, neuroscience more, more um, um, recently, but the brain 200,000 years ago, that we are driven by a need for certainty. Let's go to the next slide, yeah. We're driven by a need for certainty. And this is a, you know, one of the challenges you can imagine 200,000 years ago, that was very important because we had to know for sure if there was a lion in the grass that was gonna eat us and do away with our gene pool. Um, and whether or not five years from now there'll be more lions wasn't even a concern. It was about who are we right now and what is the threat to my survival? 
So that impulse still sits within us, but isn't as relevant to our survival as it used to be. And it's given us a, a way of looking at our internal processes and, and um, collab co collating them with our external experience in a way that gives us a better approach to, in a sense, uncertainty. But let's go back a little for a few more minutes to what happened in the Soviet Union with the parapsychological stuff. We know that the brain, m most of our internal system, um, is, a, is basically an electrical information carrier. Um, this little uh, picture on the upper right is the picture of a neuron. There are billions of neurons in the brain, uh, in the body. And the little um, um, tentacles out of there are called dendrites. And all of them connect to all other neurons, many other neurons, and they send electrical impulses back and forth to one another. And that's how our brain carries information that, as I said in the beginning, creates the model of our world for us. So we know that the primary information stimulating system is, electron is electrical, okay? Dr. Helmut Schmidt, who was a phys taught physics um, at a number of universities in Europe and the US, developed a way of, of potentially measuring whether or not an internal process in the right kind of configuration could affect an external elect electrical process. So he used a random number generator. And, and in his first work, because it's, it's developed way beyond that now, but in his first work, he used a, um, a radioactive particle, a radioactive source, as it says here, because that is what the physicists say is the most random event in nature. The, um, the, the, the emission from a radioactive source of an electronic particle, of electrical um, impulse. And so you hook that up to a Geiger counter that's hooked up to an electronic switch that, that illuminates a light. And uh, as the row of lights um, light up, it's a completely random process because it reflects the radioactive decay of the strontium source. And what he found was that first, with psychically talented people, they could put order into that randomness. And in fact, they could, with their mind, influence the, ra the random radioactive decay of the strontium source. And in a sense, bring order out of chaos. Then, and some of this came from some of the work we did at our lab, because we used it with experienced meditators, for example. And we found that, that people who are really good at managing the, in a sense, chaos of their internal source has an impact on the external um, random activity of what was then called a Schmidt generator. Um, and, and then Schmidt learned that he could actually teach people how to affect it by giving them feedback on the lights. Next slide, please. Um, so that as we receive feedback on how the lights were going and we adjusted our internal state in such a way, we could, um, we could uh, influence the, the randomness of those Go to the slide before this. Um, we're not quite there yet. Sorry about that. Back further, back further. <laughs> Sorry about it, Jim. Uh, right there. Okay. okay. So, so the Soviets, going back to what we learned about their interests, which was, how do we apply this? So there were two things that came up. There were a lot of other things they did, but these are two of the interesting things. They figured, oh, if the brain is an electrical mechanism and we can train people to affect the electronic 
um, emission of a radioactive source, then maybe those people can affect the brain functioning of a person because there's an electrical process in the brain. So there were two different um, activities they undertook. There were many other things they did that I don't know all about. But one was, you may remember that, um, that in international chess, the, the Soviet chess master was usually the best in the world. And so at big matches, they would place a couple of psychics in the audience and have the psychics concentrate on the brain of the opposition. Now, they were sophisticated enough to understand that we're not talking about a Manchurian candidate here. We're not trying to make him make the wrong move. What we're trying to do is just in some way dither a little bit with electronic signaling inside the brain such that they can't quite concentrate as well as they could without that. And then they may make the wrong move. Whether or not that you know, was important in the, in the winning streak the Soviet chess masters had, nobody knows. But it's, a, it's an example of what they were doing. And the other thing, which was interesting, is, as it says here, they created a model of the president's office in the White House, the U.S. president's office in the White House. And they had several psychics um, rotating every four or five hours, 24 hours a day, concentrating on the U.S. president's brain function. Wow. And again, not to try and make him make a decision in favor of the Soviets, but make him less capable of concentrating and thinking clearly so that he might do something they could exploit in some way. So it's an interesting you know, example of how they applied what from their point of view was actually you know, there to be done from the inner world. Next slide. And so a part of what then has emerged as we, we combine this with neuroscience. Because we know now from neuroscience that we, each one of us, has the capacity within ourselves to restructure our brains through the right um, attention and intention. Because our brain, as they say, is a neuroplastic um, object. It, it, it is malleable over time. So with the right application of a mental image process, um, um, verbal commands, et cetera, one can change one's brain in a way that has a different impact on your, your, work, your actions in the external world in, that are consistent with who you want to become rather than who you were yesterday. So the governments took advantage of this. And um, the Defense Intelligence Agency, looking at what the Soviets were doing, said that, you know, they've really begun to apply these talents to the potential manipulation of people's behavior. And so we really have to uh, monitor this in a significant way. And as it says down toward the, the second to the last sentence, the DIA concluded that Czech and Soviet, what they called psychotronic weapons would pose a severe threat to military embassy and security function. Therefore, next slide, it was the, um, one of the main supports for spending a lot of money researching psychic phenomena within the U.S. intelligence community. So over a 40-year period, 50s to the 90s, the military and intelligence communities investigated psychic phenomena and used it in, in a number of, of um, you know, especially remote viewing, in a number of, as it says here, clandestine missions to try and, and access secret information at a distance. Um, and as it says in the end there, you know, $4 million they, they committed in 2014, and that has expanded way beyond that um, now. Next slide. Because where it is now going, is that the brain is and will be the battlefield of the future. And this is where it has been taken into the weaponization. Neuroscience research 
has all of these positive applications for people who, um, you know, have some challenges mentally, et cetera, and has the um, positive side of helping us um, uh, restructure the way we are in the world to create a better life. But at the same time, it offers a significant opportunity for national security applications. And as it says in foreign policy, the same brain scanning machines meant to diagnose Alzheimer's could potentially read someone's private thoughts. And what's being done now is because neuroimaging allows us to see what brain areas um, are used for thoughts, feelings, emotions, and actions, then trained soldiers who understand this can see in different situations the brain functioning of a person at a distance based on how they're responding to the external stimuli. And then next slide, um, they've now begun to um, use technology to facilitate a kind of telepathy on the battlefield. And it goes like this. The commander thinks about a strategy to be employed by their soldiers. The commander is, you know, not on the battlefield. Soldiers are out in the battlefield. The thoughts are recorded. They're, because we now understand them, they're translated into electronic signals and broadcast to the troops. And the troops are wearing a transceiver that receives the electronic signal. So you see this is it starts with a thought. We transfer it into an electronic signal. We send it to the troops. Um, the, the commander of the troops registers it. It translates into his mind, his or her mind, what that thought is, and then he he or she can command the troops to carry out the order of the commander um, that originated in his thought process back at headquarters. And this is now being developed significantly and employed on the battlefield. Next slide. So this is the other side of, of parapsychology and, and you, in a sense. On the one hand, it relates to our inner world. And now we're using that inner world to take it into the outer world with the help of technology and influence the minds of not only our own, own troops, but enemy troops as well. So I'll stop here again and see if we have any questions, comments, thoughts about it. Jim, I have a, a general question. Um, you know, you were involved with a lot of these experiments back in the in the in the seventies, and um, you know, there's always the naysayers, like people like the amazing Randy and people like that, um, and there are people that just refuse to accept that psychic ability even exists. So, um, I guess the general question is, what do you think the block is on the part of these? I guess I'll call them materialists, to um, admit that there's there are possibilities that they don't see. Oh, obvious. Well, I, I think, you know, in the first two slides, I was pointing to that. First of all, our belief systems are what dictate how we interact in the world. And our belief systems um, are, in a sense, the, the borderline of what we, how and what we can understand in the external world. So, um, as I tried to explain with the Soviets, their approach was, hey, we don't need science to explain this because we don't think science can, but we know it works, so let's use it. Versus the Randy approach that says, there's nothing in science that proves this, so therefore it doesn't exist. And that's a belief system. It's an approach to science that is both naive and culturally dictated in a sense. That's why in the beginning, I quoted Niels Bohr, who said, People think physics is meant to describe nature. It isn't. It's meant to describe what we know about what's going on out there. It is not the limit. And so we now have quantum physics that shows us that at a certain level, fundamental level of existence of the physical world, what we call the quantum world, the physical world as we know it does not exist. And that's what quantum physics tells us. It is a, it is a collection of quantum particles in which probabilities exist. 
and in many people's interpretations, all probabilities exist. And not until a mental process that involves selecting, choosing, focusing on one outcome, does that, in a sense, the probability wave collapse into this physical world. And so a part of what um, I was going to describe in the work I did with Mike Murphy, where we studied extraordinary capabilities throughout history. You have in Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, for example, you have a list of the siddhis or the powers that purportedly arise out of the dedicated practice of meditation and yoga. And one of those was called the Animan Siddhi. And in the traditional interpretation of that or translation of that, it was about um, reducing the body to the size of the atom. But in a more current presentation or interpretation, it was about focusing the mind in such a way that it can perceive the fundamental source of where we all come from. And that's what we get into with quantum physics. And, and as, you as you dive into, or in a sense, melt into that fundamental source, which comes through extended meditation, sometimes spontaneously for other reasons, like in sports, then you uh, carry into that the capacity to remake not only the structure of your own body, but the experience and structure of the external world in a way that, that is consistent with your deepest desires. And this is where today we have more and more teachers out there who are teaching ways of creating what they say, create your, your best future by imagining who you want to become, spending time in some kind of contemplative state, using the imagination, but a lot of focus and purpose on who you want to become later as a way of moving into that future person. And in a sense, that's psychokinesis. That's about looking into the future and manipulating that possible future in a way that's consistent with who you really want to be and how we want to be in the world. And so this is, you know, one of the um, activities that's going around the world these days in small communities, sometimes larger ones, is getting groups of people to imagine a different kind of world that we live in now as a way of moving into changing civilization in a way that collaborates with nature instead of dominates nature. And, and, um, and, and so, you know, um, it has come from we have to prove it in the laboratory from scientific con under scientific conditions to we now, like the Soviets earlier, apply many of these understandings in ways that literally millions of people around the world are benefiting in, their, in the lives they are creating for themselves by, in a sense, internally using the mind to psychokinetically rearrange the brain in such a way that it then moves into a world that is more consistent with who they want to be. That doesn't mean that it's proven in a laboratory yet. But, you know, that's why I use Randy, one of the great magicians, as a good example. His belief system said to him, if I can do it by sleight of hand, it doesn't exist any other way. And that, you know, that sets a boundary on the structure of the universe in which we live, which isn't necessarily the ultimate boundary. And that's why, you know, a friend of mine and I were talking about it the other day that, as you know, um, Angelo, if we look at our lives, let me just use a personal example, neuroscience. The first course I ever took in physiology told me when I was maybe a, a, a freshman in college, I was told that by the time you're 25, your brain is set. It can never change the rest of your life. So do everything you can before you're 25, because from then on, you can never change your life. And now we know that the brain can change until we die. Doesn't matter how old it is. So science overall has done this over and over and over. 
decades at a time. We have expanded on a regular basis our understanding of how the universe works and what our place is in it and how the mind, in whatever way you relate to what that means, um, has a direct impact through our inner world on the outer world. And, of course, what we now know is, you know, we used to say in biology that the ultimate determinant of our behavior was our DNA. Now we know it isn't true. It's the expression of our DNA that matters. And the expression of our DNA is influenced by external events and all of our internal um, experiences. And so we can activate, in a sense, various aspects of our DNA in ways that turn us into a different kind of human than the one if we just sit there and let the external universe make us into whatever it wants to. We participate in this. And that's related to the parapsychology stuff because that's how I got into neuroscience, that I realized, wow, inside of us were a, a universe of, in a sense, parapsychological events. We have some non-physical aspect of ourselves that is influencing our brain, heart, gut system, and, um, and, and through proper attention and intention can remake our brain in such a way that it remakes our mind and then changes the way we act in the world. Does that help? Does that answer at all? Yes, yeah, good. I mean, it, you know, it could also be just be called a bunch of hocus pocus, you know. <laughs> but, but again, it goes back to what's your belief system? If it's big enough, you can begin to incorporate a lot of different perspectives. Um, you know, one other personal example. I told you the story of, of Margie and the, and the teleported dematerialization, whatever it was, of that watch. And um, trying to understand it, I appealed to a good friend of mine who was a master hypnotist. And he said he could hypnotize me and regress me back to that moment and freeze it in time so I would actually experience what happened, which is what he did. And, um, and, and my experience of it, I wanted to read it to you because I, because I, um, wrote about it more accurately. Through hypnosis, I was able to witness the disappearance of the watch. It was there one instant and gone the next. Immediately after, I sensed a pulsing energy, primarily darkness, within thin bands of white throughout. There was a kind of intelligence devoid of personality that permeated the space around me. A deep fear arose within me from this apparent contact with something far greater than myself. I cried. I had a smile on my face and I cried intensely. I was crying from the joy of touching the center of my being. So how do you take that into a Faraday cage and measure it? You know, if this is an element involved in some of the parapsychological phenomena, then it's going to be very, very difficult to get it to register on a monitor and write a, a formula about it. And the other thing that happened as a result of that was that um, over the next several days, as I talked to people, I had this experience of, uh, of that light and, and energy, in a sense, coming from a UFO. So I have this belief that I might have had contact with the UFO. And at a recent conference where um, Angelo um, participated uh, about UFOs and other unexplained events, um, uh, as he was telling me about it, I realized that that's a good example of how my perception dictates what I end up believing about my experience. So I could say, I had a UFO experience. Doesn't mean there was some object up there coming down and beaming on me. But it might be the same for many people who have a UFO experience, that it's the only way we can explain certain kinds of events. It's not the same as being kidnapped and your liver cut out and all that stuff. That's a different kind of UFO experience. But um, it, it, for me, it illustrates how deeply 
our, our perceptual capacities inside of ourselves have an impact on what ultimately believe um, what happens outside of ourselves. So um, you have a question from um, Ken, um, Jim. <clears throat> Hi, Jim. Thank you for everything you've shared so far. Um, am, I, am I coming through? Yes. Okay. So basically, yeah. I was going to ask, you know, when we uh, end this session, where, 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 where should we go next? How can we get some hands-on, direct, applicable methods, tools, teachings that we can start to, you know, work on this with whatever our particular concerns are. And Jim direct us toward methods or teachings, of course, it can get us started and working in a plan like that. Um, well, you know, there's, there are a lot of different, as I mentioned, there are a lot of different teachers out there who are presenting ways of becoming what I call more fully human that touch on all of the things we've been talking about. Um, there are also um, slideshows like the one you, you've been watching that I have used, because I, I teach a course in applied neuroscience at Ubiquity University. I've been teaching it for several years. And so I have you know, like you know seven or eight different PowerPoint presentations on all the various aspects of of um of neuroscience and what we just talked about um i'm glad to send a bunch of those to you to at least give you more background and in most cases it includes references so you can go look at it somewhere else i can also i am actually working on a little book something different than this but it relates to the neuroscience side um that it, it will include a list of of the teachers I'm familiar with, whose teachings I'm familiar with, um, who teach, you know, how to create a better life for yourself, make more money or be happier or, you know, have more success in your relationships, those sorts of things. Um, and how much time do we have? 20 minutes. Okay. And so, as I said, I'll put my um, email in the chat so everyone can see it. You just write to me and I'll send you some stuff. The other thing is um, the rest of the slides are going to touch on some of the answers to your question. So, um, but let's see. So let, I'll get back to it, Ken. Um, there's more to tell you, but let's see if there's any other questions before I finish the slideshow. Um, Angelo, we're now starting on... on slide 14. It's a keep, picture of a, of a neuron. Keep going? Yeah, the one before that. I think that's 13. I think that's 15. Okay. Before, before that is neuroplasticity, and before that is an image. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so um, let me just go through it a little bit more. I described it a little bit, but this is, you know, a neuron, which we talked about, but I... I include this because, again, our imagination is one of the most important faculties we have to restructure how we want to be in this world. And a part of what that does is affect our brain specifically, and having an image of where that effect goes is important, and that's the neuron. The neuron then, you know, through its dendrites, as you can see here in the image, um, communicates with other dendrites. And, and what happens is when you focus on an idea, you build neuronal networks around that idea. And if that idea is a little different from one that had driven you earlier, like, you know, I'm not a good guy, I, I just, I'm not good enough for this stuff, versus I really am powerful and I can do whatever I set my mind to do. These are opposite thoughts that are registered in the brain. And the more you focus on the one you want, the more it develops neuronal networks that hold that idea. And 
the opposite idea that is no longer given such attention um, begins to um, tear apart its neural network and no longer exists. And so this is a really crucial part of how we restructure our brain. And I include the little image in the lower right because a part of what happens is when the neuron um, um, atta attaches, in a sense, itself to another neuron through its dendrites, um, there's a, there's a, what's called a synapse. It doesn't actually physically touch it. There's a small area, a small distance in between the uh, dendrite and the next neuron. And what we, we say is there are neurotransmitter molecules or chemicals that go from one to the other across the synapse in order to carry the information or the idea or the, or the image that you're presenting. I include this because uh, a physicist friend at UC Berkeley, who is also a neuroscientist, says that there is significant evidence from a physical point of view that the size of the receptor is smaller than the size of the neurotransmitter molecule. And a traditional um, explanation of the physical world, therefore, that molecule cannot be received by the receptor. And what he says is that is a quantum event. It happens in our brain at all times. Only quantum events can um, experience this kind of, of situation where a larger um, particle than the size of its receptor can actually merge together through um, you know, the function of quantum particles. So. If that's true, and there are increasing numbers of physicists who are looking at this as a real possibility, then what we're dealing with in our brain is a constant quantum process. We're talking about billions of connections around our brain and billions of quantum processes occurring that we go back to in the fundamental structure of the quantum world holds all probabilities. So as you imagine, a probability for yourself in the future that um, is a little different from who you are today. Remember, if, if you do the same thing today that you did yesterday, you'll be the same person tomorrow. If you do it a little differently today, then tomorrow you become a little different person. And so day by day, um, we can grow into becoming what I call more fully human because in our brains, this kind of process is going on. Um, next slide, please. And this is neuroplasticity. I mentioned it earlier. And it basically says that directed mental activity, what I call a conscious, consistent, and intentional repetition of carefully chosen thoughts and actions, explicitly build new neural pathways. And William James said attention, the right kind of attention and intention allows us moment to moment to choose and sculpt who are ever changing, how our ever changing minds will work to choose he will, who we will be in the next moment in a very real sense. We're in control of this. And most of us, myself included, for most of my life and still, you know, for today and tomorrow, um, that intention comes from unconscious beliefs. And so a part of the structure is to reprogram those beliefs in a way that allow us to choose and cult our, our, how our over, ever changing mind will work to choose who will be in the next moment, next slide. And the way to put this is mind changes the brain in lasting ways, it's self-directed neuroplasticity. You can use your mind to change your brain, to change your mind for the better. And you do that by training. It takes only 20 to 30 seconds in a row to shift, to begin to build this new neural network. And that's where, you know, um, some of the neuroscientists say, any moment doesn't change your life. But if you take care of the minutes by doing this for 20 to 30 seconds in a row, the years will take care of themselves. Everything that flows through your mind sculpts your brain. So the more you participate in what flows through your mind in a way that is, in, is consistent with who you are becoming, then the years will take care of themselves. Next slide. 
Now, one of the biggest challenges is the negativity side, because all of us know that um, we have a tendency toward looking at the worst things and giving it more attention. And the biggest challenge there is not paying attention to the news. All the news is negative. You know, in fact, there have been several um, uh, attempts over the last 10 years to create positive news, and none of, they've all failed because they can't get the money. Nobody wants to advertise some positive news because negativity is what brings the viewers. Now, that started 300,000 years ago because, as I was saying earlier, remembering the negative experience guarantees that we will guard against it in the future and we will survive. So it was much more important to remember that the lion in the grass is a threat to your gene, to your survival versus sitting around the fire at night and having a good time and relaxing, you know, doesn't have that biggest impact. That's changed today. So, um, but that's something we call the negativity bias. The brain is driven by this. And so for, a, you know, an easy example is your son or daughter comes home from school and they have A's in everything except one subject and they have a D in that subject. And the common response by the parent is, how did you get a D? Not, whoa, this is an incredible report card you've got. So that's the difference between the negativity focus or the positive focus. And, um, and now we know that, you know, it has a huge impact on our health as well. Um, the more we can focus on the positive and positive experiences happen dozens of times every day, but we just don't spend enough time remembering and focusing on them. But as you can see, they have significant health benefits, stronger immune system, increased optimism, resilience, good feelings, increase the likelihood of good feelings tomorrow. And those are all things that are important for the future that is somewhat unpredictable and is gonna require more and more resilience and re resourcefulness. Next slide. Yeah, so self-directed, train your brain. Um, and, and again, it goes back to we're in charge. And so um, um, Richie Davidson, for example, you know, some of you may have heard of him, one of the leading research in, in neuroscience. Um, as he says, our brains are constantly being shaped, either unconsciously or consciously. We have the opportunity to take more responsibility and intentionally shape our own minds by shaping our brains. So again, 20 to 30 seconds, you do that on a regular basis, just feeling into the positive experience, bringing it inside and, 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 and making it more powerful, it begins to restructure the brain. You can use your mind to change your brain and change your mind for the better to benefit ourselves and other beings. One's experience matters. Next slide, it's about mindful attention. And this is a part of what, um, what we did at the very beginning. We took our attention, we focused on our breath, we looked at our, how our various appendages and body felt, and that's a mindful attention. It's like a spotlight. And because of neuroplasticity, what you pay attention to pulls its contents into the brain. So as we learn to direct our attention skillfully, we become more participatory in the restructuring of who we are. Next slide. So a couple of practices. And again, I'll send this to everybody so you can look at these for a longer period of time. But taking in the good, we, we touched on it. As good things happen, bring them deeply into your internal world and Feel them in an excited way. Look for and take in positive experiences. Turn positive facts into positive experience. Savor the experience. And imagine or feel the experiences entering deeply into your mind and body. Really immerse in it. And that affects the brain and restructures the brain and mind. And every time you take in the good, you build a little bit of neural structure. You do it a couple of times a day and it changes tomorrow. So turn everyday good experiences into good neural structures. Um, 
and an important element, treat yourself as if you matter. It's really about self-care. Next slide. Um, recognize that it's up to you. So this is a little exercise, um, and you can do it yourself. If we had a little more time, I'd lead us through it, but it's just a good example, inner smiling. You know, smiling, inner and outer, smiling is contagious. Um, one of the positive uh, practices on a daily basis is just as you walk down the street, smile to people. And people are affected. People's brains are affected by the smile of a stranger. Um, and inner smiling, smiling within yourself, reduces stress, improves your health, etc. And it gen self generates acceptance, gratitude, care, brings the heart rhythms into balance. And so as your body relaxes and you imagine, for example, your, your son or daughter or your husband or wife or your best friend having a great experience, it generates a smile. Oh, I remember that. That was great. So you can do that inside and generate an inner smile. Next slide. And the inner smiling experience um, is an important one. So let's just take a minute. It will only take a minute. Close your eyes. Take a couple of deep breaths. And here the heart becomes important. Imagine breathing in and out of the heart. Breath flowing in and out of the heart. Focus your attention there. And then smile into your heart. Bring to mind someone whom you care for. And recall something that they love to do. And you smile. Smile in your heart. And imagine and feel that heart smile expanding to infuse every cell of your body. It's an easy exercise to do throughout the day. And at a time, especially when things are stressful or it's challenging, or you're done with something and you feel good about it, then just go inside a little bit and enrich your inner world in a way that brings a smile to your heart and your face and, and your life generally. Next slide, please. So probably all of you have heard about now gratitude, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time with it because most of us know that there's, you know, enormous research now on the positive impact of gratitude. And so here are just a couple of examples that makes us happier, makes people like us, strengthens our emotions, boosts our careers, makes us healthier. And here's a, um, a little reference. And Jeff Walker says, if gratitude were a drug, it would be the most popular drug in the world. Next slide. Because of what it does for us, all of these various aspects of our personality, emotional world, health, career, social life are affected positively by gratitude. These are the benefits of gratitude. Now, another reference you can look at later. Next, next slide. And it's a simple process. You know, the attitude of gratitude, as they say, um, it's a simple process. It only takes a couple of minutes. And those couple of minutes done day by day can change your life. So writing is important because the act of writing has a different impact on the brain than, than typing, for example. And I'll give a couple of examples in a minute. Um, so a gratitude journal. Um, like I have my journal here. And I right in the morning and sometimes it doesn't happen until the day till the night and it usually includes five or six things of you know gratitude i have a balcony outside of my bedroom and and i'm on the third floor and so um, i can see the whole uh, horizon and in the morning the sun comes up and i can sit on the balcony with the sun coming up and it inspires me to I'm grateful for the sun, the light, and the warmth. Thank you, brother sun. I'm grateful for the air I'm breathing now. I'm grateful for this chair. I can just relax. I'm grateful for this balcony that holds me here. You know, anything that is in this moment, like 348, you have an incredible chair you're sitting in. Um, 
and that's something to be great. You know, simple things. I'm grateful that I could talk to you today. Um, I'm grateful that your uh, husband or boyfriend or whomever in the yellow shirt behind you is getting a cup of coffee for himself or for you. You know, um, it's simple. Only takes a couple of minutes. You can write them down. That helps. And then, you know, something a little more extreme when you wake up, say thank you out loud for 10 things in your life. That's a little harder for me because my wife sleeps longer than I do. <laughs> if, I, if I start yelling these things, it'll... It, it, it's not the positive effect of gratitude on relationship that everybody says it. So you have to choose the things. But, you know, one, the last one was one of the things I really like, which is just throughout the day, think of someone you like and just send them an email. You know, I'm really grateful for your friendship. Or thank you very much for, you know, talking to me the other night when I was a little bit depressed. Or just simple things like that. And that expression of gratitude has a huge impact on our internal world. And as Epictetus says, um, he is a wise person. He said, man, that, that's no longer appropriate. Who does not grieve for the things he has not, but rejoices for those which he has. Next slide. Important practice. Most of you probably know it. And as I said, writing is important. When we write, a unique neural circuit is activated. And what they now say in the very bottom here, the last paragraph, they've studied this in both the laboratory and in classrooms. Students learn better when they take notes by hand and when they type them on a keyboard. And some of you may know that in the US, I don't know about Europe, but I suppose it may be similar, a number of lecturers in universities are now outlawing the use of electronic note taking in their lecture classes because they find that the students who take notes by hand get better grades. They do better on a test than the others. Next slide. So writing is important. Just keep that in mind when you can do some journaling. So here's some practices, Dan, uh, Ken. Um, taking in the good, which I mentioned, you know, it increases neural pathways. And then here's something that, you know, I uh, teach in my class, which I like. I sort of, um, uh, made it up myself that I call back pocket positivity. Takes a couple of minutes, but it's a practice in which you reflect on your earlier life and remember one of the greatest moments that made you really celebrate yourself and everything around you. One of the greatest memories you have of wonder and excitement and celebration and and gladness. And and bring it back to life inside of yourself. And then what I describe as, then take it and put it in your back pocket. So when you're out in the world and something's really challenging, you can take one of these back pocket positivity moments and renew it and change the way you're viewing your external world. And that changes your experience. And then of course, smiling, daily gratitude, um, and and um, all of these are important for installing new neural traits. Go on, Angelo, next slide. Um, so you can read this a little later, but it's something that you know, I like. Um, <laughs> it's an exercise in perspective. And I think about it now and then. You know, I was walking the dog the other day, and I stopped, and I was being grateful for mother earth showing me how incredible life springs forth out of a plowed field and i remembered that you know i think i'm just walking along but in fact we're currently traveling at 850 kilometers per second through space you know when was the last time any of us thought about this we just traveled thousands of miles in the time it took to read the previous sentence we're sitting on a planet the spinning on its own axis, it zooms around the solar system, and the solar system is zooming around again. And when we walk down the sidewalk, we think like, oh, everything's standing still, and I'm just walking along. In reality, there's no fixed spot on the surface of the planet. And, um, and then the solar system isn't stationary. The sun and all the planets are spinning around the center of the Milky Way, blah, blah, blah. It's hard to really comprehend <laughs> the fact that planet Earth is zooming around a massive solar system that's zooming around an ever more 
massive galaxy that's hurtling through an unfathomably large universe, and we wonder if parapsychology is real. I mean, you know, this is an example of expanding our possibilities a bit and becoming cognizant of what the universe actually is and what it holds and who we are inside of ourselves that can express something dramatically different than what everyone has expressed in the past. Next slide. Um, and I just wanted to, you know, a little thing from Albert Einstein, you can read it later. Um, and it's just about the same thing. Our task is to free ourselves from the prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature and its beauty. And that is a crucial element of where we're going to get to where we need to go to change the way civilization is, is in relationship to Mother Nature and planet Earth and, and uh, humans and the rest of life collaborate instead of compete. Okay, that's my. <laughs> Any other questions? Quick. Oh, no. We're over by two minutes. Quick, <laughs> quick, quick. Okay, questions and comments. What do you want to do with all this? What can I do to help you all? Um... I'd, I'd like to make a comment just that, um, you yeah, know, it's such a great presentation. I mean, just so informative, so comprehensive. Um, and, and so useful, the useful part, you know, you, you, so the way you brought it together, I mean, talk about feeling gratitude. Wow. Great stuff. Great. Inspirational. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. And, I, I'll uh, be sending out the slides that Jim did with his permission, along with his email address. And Jim has so much to offer. I would encourage you to, um, you know, to correspond with him. He'll give you resources and you know, and, help you in any way you can. and Angelo, um, if you want, I can do it, but you can do it. Way. Uh, turn it into a PDF, not okay. a slideshow. And I'll then it's a document they can. <laughs> and then, Bill, I just want to make one other comment in response to what you said, because one of the things that is hardest for us to practice is appreciation when someone gives us a compliment, you know, and and I still have the knee jerk response. Oh, great, thanks. Versus, whoa, that really feels good. Take in the positive, you know, thank you very much for saying that. And so I also want us to remember the saying of it to others, you know, to express appreciation to others for the small things or the large thing they bring into our lives and then learn how to feel the appreciation for that when someone else gives it to us. It's both places and it enriches our inner world, which is the determining factor of what we experience in our outer world, regardless of what all the politicians say. So what else? Mary and Avery, what do you think? Did, is that okay for you? I had, a, um, I had a comment, if I could get in with a comment um, on a couple of things that you touched on. Um, one, in terms of like, um, I would say like group consciousness of like, being around multiple people working for the same outcome or at least buying for the same outcome um how that shows up in different ways and like um a way i linked it more recently was in sporting events you had thirty thousand people and x amount want one thing to happen and x amount want the other thing to happen and it's like playing out in real time um so i thought that was interesting the way we can all connect here and it manifest and in, in some sort of outcome um and then also i thought it was interesting at the end when you talked about um they're just being grateful just for realizing we're on a moving rock right now <laughs> um <laughs> it's like really crazy to think about and um even in terms of how we got here and came from like literally being children learning how to stabilize ourselves on this moving rock to you know coming along and learning and understanding and things like that. I think that was very interesting. Well, two quick comments back to you, Joe. One on um, your first point. There are two things that they are relevant. As you may know, there was once a significant movement in transcendental meditation. The Maharishi came from India and he taught, you know, hundreds, dozens of thousands of people, TM. And they talked about you know, some of the cities, some people supposedly levitated and that kind of stuff. 
Um, and that may or may not have been true. What did, what was done in a good research study by a scientist who was a TM practitioner is they, um, they took a certain period of time in which a group of meditators in a specific community spent a certain amount of time every day practicing TM. And they found over time that the incidence of violent crime went down during that period. And so it's suggestive. It's not, you know, it's suggestive. It's what you were saying. And what and then what it translates into for me in the modern stuff, some of these teachers is one of the main things people teach is find the community of like minded people. The more you spend time with people who tell you, no, 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 you can't do that. That was a terrible thing. Then the less then the more challenging it is to stay in the other side of what your brain can do. So you're absolutely right, you know, finding your community and getting support or, you know, and one of the things I've been taught that I have to be careful about is that I have this grand image of myself in a year and a half and I have all the, the, the. and one of the things they say is don't tell anybody who doesn't agree with us because they'll say, that's stupid. You can never do that. And then so, you know, I wait till I'm on a Zoom call with seven or eight other people who are also doing the same practice. And then we all tell each other, but other than that, I don't talk about it. <laughs> I told my 16 year old son about part of it recently. And he said, you know, a really great image, dad. Once you accomplish it, let me know and I'll believe you. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, I guess I have to break this love fest up here. Um, so I'm going to send out, you know, the slides to everybody and um, also Jim's email and I also want to let you know we have a private sacred inclusion network community and I'll send out the, the email for that and hopefully you'll join us and uh, Jim I don't and, know what to say this is like if fantastic. you email me to write remind me that we met on this conversation so well you know re remember who you all are and and in the meantime I'm gonna you know just to create this one I went through a lot of a number of my past courses and pulled out pieces because I'd never done this whole thing before. And so I'll pull together some of those earlier ones as well to give you more data um, that you can either use or not use. It's up to you. I mean, okay. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks a lot. Thank Jim, you, everybody. Thank you so much. Have a good, good night. Have a good tomorrow. See you later. Thank right. you.